Right now you're seeing my warm buddies. You can see them wiggling here. This is a typical view we see from the scope we use in the lab. Here you can see an adult worm, which is one millimeter long. Think about the thickness of your credit card. And if you zoom in a little bit, you can see some larva and eggs more clearly. Now you may be wondering why can't we use animals that are easier to see and less gross so that we can see them with bare eyes and pet them while we do the experiments? Like a duck? Dog? A hedgehog maybe? A squirrel? Or cats? By the way, these are my own cats. They're super cute. There are several advantages for using C. elegans in research. First, they have a very rapid life cycle. It only takes three days for worms from an egg to an adult. This makes our experiment a lot faster to process. Also, most C. elegans are hermaphrodites, meaning that they don't need to mate to breed. One adult worm alone is able to make a lot of eggs and have a lot of children. It's incredibly easy for us to get new worms this way. If you want a worm that has certain genes, we just buy some from the company and wait for them to lay eggs. And we'll have a bunch of worms with the same genes for all kinds of experiment. You might also notice from our scope view that C. elegans have transparent bodies. This makes them incredibly easy for imaging experiments. Here is one example of an image we produce in lab. The glowing means that a specific gene is expressed in this worm. Now, let me ask you an important question. What do you think nematode worms eat? As you have probably guessed, they eat bacteria. I know, it's kind of gross. This is a plate we use in the lab to keep the worms, and we call them seeded if they have this kind of lawn of bacteria on them. This is a plate with worms on it. You will just be able to distinguish the individual worms with bare eyes because they're really, really small. Now, I have another thought question for you. Do you think the worms would live longer or shorter if you give them less than enough bacteria to eat? The answer might be surprising to you, but they do live longer under food restriction. This is a typical lifespan curve. You can see that the red curve shows worms under dietary restriction, and they have a higher survival rate than the fed worms at the same days of life. In fact, this is one way among many others to extend lifespan in C. elegans. Dietary restriction is defined as reduced calorie intake without malnutrition. Other studies have shown that food restriction can extend lifespan in many different animals, from single-celled yeast to dogs and monkeys. When a worm experiences food restriction, FMO2 gene is induced to express, meaning that the gene results in production of the protein, and the protein serves certain cellular functions, and the end result is increased in longevity. So overexpression of FMO2 gene is another important way to make the worms long-lived. FMO stands for flavin-containing monooxygenase. I know it's a mouthful. This is an enzyme involved in metabolism. The name FMO can refer to both the protein and the gene that encodes the protein. So basically many but not all genes in your body will be eventually translated to produce proteins we need to survive. This process is like you bought a bookcase from Ikea and you have to read the instruction manual to assemble it at home. A gene is like the instruction manual that contains information to make a product, which is the protein. Now back to FMO. FMO is a family of genes that has five versions, and we call them FMO 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now you may be wondering again, why do we care about FMO gene in worms lifespan if you want to know how we can live longer? We do research on worms because FMO genes are present not only in worms, but also in humans and other mammals such as mice. Worms are the easiest to study among these organisms. Although we know that mammals like us also have the five different FMOs, it's important to keep in mind that the five FMOs do not correspond. For example, FMO1 in worms is not the same as FMO1 in humans. 
which is also why we need more research on the role of different FMOs in humans. We already know that FMO2 overexpression leads to longevity. Because FMO1 has a similar structure as FMO2, I'm curious if FMO1 overexpression can also make the worm long-lived and what its relationship is with FMO2. I know all these gene expression stuff can be overwhelming and confusing, so let's make an analogy. Imagine there are two types of power gems, blue and pink. Blue gem is FMO1 and pink gem is FMO2. When I present this little explosion symbol next to the gem, it means that the genes are overexpressed. And when I put the forbidden symbol on the gems, it means that genes are knocked out or absent. Now imagine there is this super long-lived worm monster. It needs these power gems inside its body to support its living, but also needs some food, otherwise it'll starve to death. This is what we already know. When the blue gem and the food are normal, but we have the super pink gem, we have a long-lived worm monster. So when FMO2 is overexpressed and other things are normal, we have an increase in lifespan. So we can come to the conclusion that the super pink gem alone can increase lifespan of the worm monster. Another thing we already know is that when we have the normal power gems, but give the worm less food, we also get a long-lived worm monster. So decreased food alone can increase lifespan of the worm monster. The third thing we know is that while you still decrease food, if you get rid of the pink gem, you'll end up getting a normal worm instead of a long-lived worm monster. Therefore, we come to the conclusion that you have to have the pink gem for decreased food to increase lifespan. Now let's look at what we found with our current study. We first examined the effect of the super blue gem alone. We kept everything else the same, but only activated the blue gem to make it a super blue gem. The result is that we got a long-lived worm monster. This shows that the super blue gem alone can increase lifespan of the worm. Remember we knew this before? If we decrease food, the worm becomes long-lived. Now, when we kept the reduced food, but got rid of the blue gem, we observed that the worm did not become long-lived. It remained a cute, innocent, regular worm. Together with our previous knowledge, we come to this conclusion that both the blue gem and the pink gem are necessary for food restriction to increase lifespan. As a refresher of our previous knowledge, we knew that having a super pink gem with other things remain the same would give us a long-lived worm monster. Now, we kept these conditions the same, but got rid of the blue gem. We wanted to see what the relationship between the two gems are. We observed that without the blue gem, the super pink gem didn't work anymore. We got this cute worm with a normal lifespan again. Therefore, we came to the conclusion that for the super pink gem to work, the blue gem must be present. So the blue gem is required for the super pink gem to increase lifespan. With all these findings, we come to our final working model. Our model suggests that food restriction is the most upstream factor, and the pink gem, or FMO2, is downstream of the food restriction. The blue gem, or FMO1, is downstream of the pink gem, which all eventually leads to longevity. What does this mean? The model is basically shows the interaction of these factors. Let's look at a few examples of what would happen if we change the factors. First, if we get rid of FMO1, the path is cut and we cannot reach longevity. You can think of this model as a bridge. If one segment of the bridge is broken, you will not be able to reach the other end. So similarly, if you knock out only FMO2 or both FMO2 and FMO1, you will not be able to reach longevity. Lastly, if you change the most upstream factor, the food restriction into normal amount of food, you won't get longevity either. This project is still ongoing and we're trying to identify more factors in this pathway. 
Specifically, we're trying to find out the factors downstream of FMO1. The main takeaway from this video is this working model. You can pause here if you want a refresher of what we just talked about. Thank you for your attention to research happening at University of Michigan. I hope you enjoyed our journey together raising this cute little worm. See you next time.